Good morning. My name is Gwendolyn Darty. In behalf of the Reverend Dr. Rudolph Overstreet, the pastor of this church, our Sunday School Superintendent, Mrs. Doris Rudolph, and the lead teacher of the Alpha and Omega class, Reverend Horace Carter, I will be teaching the class today on November the 14th, entitled, Praise for God's Eternal Grace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are my creator and my counselor, guiding me daily to make wise decisions. You are my comforter in sorrow, pain, or distress. I praise you for drawing near to me when I draw near to you. You are eternal Lord. You are my heavenly Father and the Father of the fatherless. How great are you and your faithfulness, day in and day out. You are holy, yet you make a way for me to approach you. I praise you for being my helper and for your Holy Spirit's convictions, correction, and protection in my life. You are invisible, but I see you with my eyes of faith. You are Jehovah God and Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides for all my needs. I praise you, my God, you heal, and for being Jehovah Rara, my faithful shepherd. You are not only king, you are king of kings and lord of lords. And yes, you are Jesus, the name above all names. I praise you for all you have done for me and what you will do. I praise you, God, for giving me new grace and mercy each day. Heavenly Father, most of all, I praise you because you are worthy to be praised. All my love, all my pr praise to you. Lord, oh Lord, how excellent is your name in which I pray, amen. Okay. Today's lesson, praise for God's eternal reign. The background for this is Revelation chapter 11. The printed text is Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. Our devotional reading is Revelation 1, verses 9 through 17. I will do the devotional reading. I, John, your brother and companion, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that our, our all in Jesus was in the island of Patus, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Oedipus, Smyrna, Perinus, Tyanaceus, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Lathidius. I turned towards to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a blazing thing. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing water. In his right hand, he had seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I have read to you the background, chapter 1, verses 9 through 17. The printed text is chapter 11, verse 
11, 15 through 18, the worship and the wonders, chapter 19. The aim for change. By the end of this lesson, we will define the nature of God's reign for eternity. Reflect on how God's eternal reign affects our faith. Engage in activities that reflect the sovereignty of God in healthy, powerful, and transforming ways. The printed texts this week are the worship, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15 through 18, outline two, the wonder, verse 19. And the verses read as followed. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And 24 elders who sat before God on their throne fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great powers and reign. The nation were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead, and that they shall be judged, and that you should reward your servants and prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightning, noises, thundering, an earthquake, and great hail. The people, places, and times. The trumpet. In this section of Revelation chapter 11, an angel sounds a trumpet and the ongoing worship around the throne enters a different phase. The sounding of the trumpet first represents God's judgment. You can see that in Revelation chapter 8 verse 6 to 13. In ancient times, the trumpet would sound to call the Israelites to order and draw their attention to what may be happening in the temple. There is even a feast of trumpets in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 23 and 25. The blowing of the trumpet is a signal to draw attention to God. First, his holiness, his victory, his liberty and guidance are all acknowledged by the trumpet. Then, of course, any time there is an acknowledgement of God, there must be praise. The background. While many traditions have encouraged a reaction of fear of his book, its actual purpose is not to elicit fear, but rather to elicit an unadulterated, unhinged, worship to the Almighty God. The book of Revelation largely tells the drama of completion of God's plan played out in three separate acts. Act one, featuring seals being opened. Act two, featuring trumpets heralding the arrival of God. And act three, celebrating, featuring the vows of judgment on those who reject God. Each act contains songs of celebrating the action. Revelation chapter 11 describes the actions ending in act two, the blowing of the seven trumpets. In verse 16, we see the four and 27 elders giving worship to God, their concentrated purpose. Not only is their positions notable for seniority and designation, but the level of their praise is so intense that it sets a high standard for anyone endeavoring to obtain a position within the contemporary terrestrial church. Leadership is not about the robe, 
the title or position. Leadership is ultimately about worship and providing an example to com of complete devotion to God. In verses 15 through 18, it talks about God's worship. Verse 15 our says, And the seven angels sounded, and there was great voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world are become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. John has been warned of three terrible wars in the coming to earth, but up to this point, only two of them has taken place. You can read those in Revelation chapter 8, 13, chapter 9, verses 12, 11, and verse 14. However, one war still remains possible, the worst of all, and it was to come quickly. But when the seven angels sounded the trumpet and said of the third war taking place at that time, John said, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world are to become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. The word great voices mean loud voices. These heavenly voices are not identified, but John heard them shouting out loud, saying, the kingdom of this world are become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. The people of God have longed to see what John saw. God has become the king over the entire earth. David even prophesied that a day was coming when God of heaven would set up the kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and it shall stand forever and ever. See Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. The vision that John had assured that with these great voices were proclaiming was sure to come to pass, just as the uncountable multitude praised God in Jesus Christ. Hear these unidentified voices do the same thing. When God becomes king over all the kingdom of the world, he will share his reign with our Lord and of his Christ. And therefore, the kingdom of the world will be Christ as well. The last part of this verse says, and he shall reign forever and ever. History has proven that earthly kingdoms don't last but God's reign will never end and is eternal for lasting forever and ever. Verse 16, the posture of the elders. And this verse says, and the four and 20 elders which sat before God on their seat fell upon their face and worshiped God. We are introduced to the four and 20 elders, which is 24 which sat before God on their seat. In Revelation, and there are, they are sitting on 24 seats around God's throne, wearing white cloth and golden crowns. The fact that they were dressed in white and wearing crowns indicates that they represented the church. The very word elder has church significance. In Revelation, these elders are seen wearing crowns which throughout the New Testament are exclusively presented as reward to the faithful in the church. The elders also sit on thrones which are associated with the central judgment throne of God. The appearance of these elders already glorified, crowned, and enthroned in heaven before the opening of the sealed book of judgment. And before and end times, judgment are loosed upon the world, reaffirms that the church will not suffer the judicial wrath, and judgment of that time will be seen as the judgment of those disrespecting or unrespecting God. Also in Revelation, 
the 24 elders are in a worshiping posture. However, it says that they rose from their seat and they fell upon their face and worshiped God. This posture indicates that they are worshiping God the Almighty with reverence and humility. The elders are seen in this posture of falling down before the throne of God worshiping him more than once in Revelation. And these acts are seen in Revelation chapter 4, verse 10, Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, chapter 14, verse 7, 11, and chapter 19, verse 4. The 17th verse is an acknowledgement of God's power, saying, we give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great powers and hast regained its reign. Here John tells us what the elders were saying as they worship God. They said in unison, we give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come. This song of praise from the 24 elders bring to mind what God said about himself just before John's first vision. But there is one significant difference. Here, John describes God as almighty, but now the elders describe him as Lord God Almighty, recognizing him as the ruler of all as well as being omnipotent to all powerful. The elders give God thanks because that has taken to thee thy great powers and has reigned. God has taken or used his great power to overthrow the kingdom of the world and their evil and instead he has re regained the powers that prophesies phrase look ahead to the result of the final judgment of God that will bring the earth to him and God will establish a new heaven and a new earth. This can be seen in Revelations chapter 21, also in Isaiah chapter 65 verse 17 and 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 13. Verse 18 is a message of judgment. This verse says, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they shall be judged, and they should, should give rewards unto the servants and the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear his name, both small and great, and should have destroyed them which destroyed the earth. As a result of God exerting his power over the nation, and kingdom of the world. We see the elders saying, and the nations were angry, and their wrath have come. The nations of the world also not angry because they had to face God's wrath, which has finally come in judgment. It was a time when God taken a just revenge upon the enemies of his paid people, repaying tribulation to those who had troubled them. The prophet Zephanitis had prophesied about the coming of the great day of the Lord in Zephanias chapter 1 verse 14. And now John received a vision of it arriving. This will not only be a time of God's wrath unto the unbelieving nations, but it will also be a time of the dead that they shall be judged. At the end of time approaches, there were two resurrections of the dead. The first resurrection will be all those who died after trusting in the Lord. These dead will rise at the rapture. See 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 through 17. But the phase, the time of the dead, 
that they should be judged also refers to the second resurrection, when the wicked and unbelievers have died throughout history and resurrect from the dead to face the great white throne of judgment. This can be seen in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Resur the elders continue to praise God for his power as they say to him that this world also be a time that thou should give us reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. It will be a time in which God will reward his people faithfulness, service, and suffering. Two groups are mentioned here to be rewarded, the prophet and the saints. The term prophets in the Old Testament referred to those who foretold or prophesied God's message, while in the New Testament, prophets are those who foretold or preach God's message. These are both God's servants who spoke exactly what he had told them to say. The saints are God's holy and sacrificed ones. They have been separated from the world and consecrated to the service and worship of God. Fathers of the Lord are referred to as saints throughout the Bible. Both groups, the prophets and the saints, are among those identified as them that fear or respect the name, both small and great. God will reward both groups as one of the judgment seats of Christ says. At the rapture, in the last part of this verse, the elders describe that there will also be a time when God should destroy them which destroy the earth or cause destruction to the earth. This will be the final phase of God's judgment upon the world and he will create a whole new heaven and earth. This has been mentioned before. The second outline talks about the wonders. Our final verse says, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the ark of the testament, and there was lightning and a voice and thundering and earthquake and great hail. At this point in John's vision, the temple of God was open in heaven. The heavenly temple is God's large sanctuary and the center of worship. When the temple was open, John saw the art of his testament or the art of the covenant. When the temple was open, doing this, it reminded John of the Israelites, how they wandered in the wilderness, and their most important possession was the sacred object of the temple of the ark. In the original tabernacle, the temple, the ark, was kept in the holy of holiness, and it was contained in there the tables or the law, the Ten Commandments. The art symbolizes God's presence with his people. The art disappeared when Nebuchadnezzar's army destroyed Jerusalem in 586 BC and has not been seen since. But John was given an unspeakable and invaluable privilege to see the art or his testament and the holy are holies, the Ark of the Testament, which he said symbolized the presence of God, that God had returned to his people. It appears that the same time that the temple of God was opened in heaven, there were lightning and voices and thundering and an earthquake and great hail. These same things happened when the seven angels opened the seventh seal of God's judgment. The opening of the temple was accomplished by the flashing of lightning, loud rumbling, or thunder, an earthquake, and great hailstorm, 
In the scriptures, hell is often associated with God's judgment as it is here. See Exodus chapter 9, verse 18 through 27, Joshua chapter 10, verse 11, Psalms chapter 78, verses 47 through 48, and Isaiah chapter 28, verses 17, chapter 30, verses 30. In conclusion, we are chapter 11, verse 15 through 18 shows us the truth is declared in verse 15. In verse 16, the posture of the elders. Verse 17, the acknowledgement of God's power. Verse 18, a message of judgment. And verse 19, the opening of the temple. This week's lesson tells us that John was given a vision of the wrath of God to come. He will come and judge the unbelieving nations for sure. There are many people who don't believe that there will be judgment of the unbelievers or sinners, or there will be righteous rewards for those who are righteous. But in John's vision, God assures mankind that both will take place. God never tells us something that won't happen, and we have seen this many times. He is indeed the God of power, who he has the power to accomplish all of his plans, and he will. We know that God's words is not, does not come back void. So, as believers, we need to be very mindful of those who don't believe, those who try to take us away from God's word, and those who are just there to say that this will not happen. We do know that it will. God has shown that many times. And what God said he'll do, he will do. Let us pray. With all my heart, I praise you, God. You are my high priest. You became my redeemer when you died for me. You set me free. You rose again and gave me victory over death. No longer am I enslaved in sin. You are my salvation, my rescuer, and my refuge. You give me hope within. I praise you because you are trustworthy and true. You are my teacher, and your understanding of wisdom is forever. You promise wisdom to me when I ask. You are my way, the truth, and the light. Lord, I love you, I delight in you, and I rejoice in you. You know the number of hairs in my head, and you are always thinking of me. You are preparing a place for me so that one day I will live with you forever. You are the light of my life. I will praise you continuously, and I will praise you in love and in song. Lord, I love you, I praise you. Lord, oh Lord, how excellent is your name. I praise you, amen.